Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and we're very excited to have you here today for another installment of our EBM EBFM seminar series. A few quick logistical points. If you are having issues with your audio or visual, please log in. I mean, log out and then log back in. That should solve most of your issues. If you are still having um, problems, you can chat me or you can send an email to library.brownbag at noaa.gov and I will help you troubleshoot. Uh, we will be accepting questions throughout, but we will hold those until the end of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, don't worry, we will pass that on to the speaker and they will answer you offline. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peg Brady to introduce us today. Greetings, everyone. This is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology. Uh, I hope everyone is well and uh, safe, um, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're continuing our NOAA EBM, Ecosystem-Based Management and Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management Seminar Series this month, and uh, we have had this series on since uh, late November. Our main objectives have always been to showcase the excellent work that's being done to implement EBM and EBFM uh, from our NOAA fisheries uh, uh, staff and to increase awareness uh, with regard to EBFM and to better understand our marine ecosystems. Um, obviously, Katie uh, had just introduced herself. NOAA Library has been a great co-host in the series. Um, and each presentation is publicly accessible and recorded and archived at the NOAA Library site. Uh, past recordings are available and presentations can be found at the NOAA Library Brown Bag site. And this uh, presentation today will be available probably within uh, 48 hours uh, if you have some colleagues that are unable to join us today. Um, following today's presentation, as Katie mentioned, there'll be some questions to our speaker. Um, we'll probably be able to take uh, sort of the uh, rather simple questions, but then there'll be a more detailed opportunity to follow up with uh, Mary uh, following uh, her presentation. And I want to thank our speaker today and to all the folks that have joined us today. Uh, Mary joins us from her, um, um, well, actually, she's probably not at her facility, <laughs> but she's with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center based at the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. And she's here to join, uh, to share with her, us uh, the work with respect to testing approaches for early detection of marine ecosystem shifts. So Mary, um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Great. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Peg and Katie, and thanks to your colleagues for giving me the opportunity to share some of my work today. Um, before I begin, I'd first like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work. They include scientists from the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, colleagues uh, at the Environmental Defense Fund, NOAA colleagues at the Alaska Fishery Science Center, Northwest Center, and Southwest Fishery Science Center, and collaborators at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Memorial University in Canada. I'd also like to acknowledge our funding sources, which include the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Pew, and NOAA, and in particular, NOAA's Fisheries and the Environment Program. Before I started my position with NOAA, um, I was a postdoc on a large multi-institutional project called the Ocean Tipping Points Project, which has been uh, my motivation for much of the work that I will be presenting today. The term tipping point has become increasingly popular in scientific literature over the past decade or so. It's applied in many disciplines, including ecology, climate science, social science, and economics. And it's often used interchangeably with terms such as regime shifts, uh, ecosystem shifts, and thresholds. Um, and I will likely be referring to these terms interchangeably throughout my talk today. So I'd like to start um, by defining what I mean by ocean tipping points. My colleagues and I who have been involved in the Ocean Tipping Points Project use the definition shown here, uh, which is when incremental changes in human use or environmental conditions result in large and sometimes abrupt changes in ecosystem structure, function, and often benefits to people. And uh, tipping points, they can occur in multiple forms. Uh, they can occur when there are um, linear relationships between uh, a driver, here shown on the x-axis, and ecosystem response, shown on the y. Um, when the relationships are linear, but the underlying drivers exhibit threshold behavior that's tracked 
by the ecosystem response over time. They can occur when the relationships between the driver and ecosystem response is nonlinear, as shown in this middle plot. And they can also occur under conditions of hysteresis, which means that the relationship between the driver and the response is different before and after a shift. And in such cases, recovery to the original state or regime is difficult. My colleagues, uh, Carrie Kappel and Courtney Scarborough and others um, uh, who have been working uh, on the Tipping Points project uh, during that time, uh, created a database of documented tipping points around the world. And they found evidence of tipping points in a wide range of habitat types across the globe. This map here shows about 100 examples of tipping points across different geographies and habitats, including uh, reefs, kelp forests, salt marshes, seagrasses, and pelagic systems. And the examples of tipping points continue to grow. The work also shows that climate over harvesting and eutrophication are the top drivers of ecosystem shifts published in the literature and they often act in concert. And they found that once a tipping point has been crossed, these shifts can persist for quite a while. Most of the examples in their database uh, reported shifts that last for decades, suggesting that recovery, when possible, can take a while. So a classic example of a tipping point, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, comes from the Northeast Pacific uh, kelp and kelp forest systems. Here, when uh, sea otters are re, uh, removed from the system, this releases sea urchins from predation, which allows them to quickly multiply and graze the kelp forest down. And this results in the transition from a kelp forest system to an urchin barren system. Another well-known example, particularly in the fisheries world, comes from the Gulf of Alaska. In the 1970s, nearshore surveys and commercial catches were dominated by crustaceans such as shrimp. However, following a shift in the PDO around the late 1970s, um, higher numbers of ground fish such as cod were observed. And by the late 1980s, cod, arrowtooth flounder, and other ground fish species dominated the survey and commercial catches. And this uh, change pretty much uh, persisted ever since. Now, because um, abrupt ecosystem changes can have large social and economic impacts, and because of the concern that under a changing climate, we may see more frequent and more extreme climate perturbations, there's been increasing interest in ocean tipping point science, both in the scientific and management communities. For example, tracking and providing early warning of changes in ecosystem state has become a key objective in science plans for NOAA fisheries and regional fisheries science centers. This objective is included in the NOAA fisheries uh, climate science strategy. Also, Phil Levin and Christian Molman published a paper in 2015 that develops guidance on how regime shift theory can be better incorporated into management through NOAA's integrated ecosystem assessments. And one section of the IEA loop that incorporates uh, regime shift theory highlights the need to define ecological thresholds to be avoided and to develop leading or early warning indicators of regime shifts. So my collaborators and I have been contributing to ocean tipping point science in multiple ways, including identifying nonlinearities and driver response relationships, identifying thresholds in those relationships, and testing for early detection of abrupt change in marine systems. For example, I led a project uh, that characterized the relationships between drivers and ecological responses in pelagic marine systems. And my colleagues and I found that highly nonlinear relationships are common, indicating that there may be detectable thresholds in that relationship that could help inform target setting um, in ocean systems. My colleagues at the Northwest Center and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center have gone a step further and have developed a framework to define ecosystem-based th thresholds for human environment and environmental pressures um, that could be used as management reference points. And I believe Jamil Samhuri uh, presented uh, some of his work during the EBFM seminar last spring. For my seminar today, I'll be presenting some work focused on this last bullet point here, which is testing approaches for early detection of abrupt changes um, in marine systems. In the first part of my talk, I'm going to present some of our work uh, where my colleague Mike Litzow and I reviewed and tested the potential utility of generic early warning signals to predict impending shifts in marine systems. And then for the second part of my talk, I will present a project in which my colleagues and I have been working to develop a state index to detect community or ecosystem level responses to climate perturbations. So over the past 10 to 15 years, an active area of ecological research has been on the development of statistical methods to identify indicators of impending regime, shift, regime shifts. 
which are referred to as generic early warning signals. And these are metric-based indicators that are based on complex systems theory of critical transitions and alternative stable states. And in particular, they're linked to the phenomenon that is a, as a population or other ecosystem, variable, other ecosystem variables approach a tipping point, they tend to show higher variability and become more correlated either spatially um, and or temporally. And early warning signals have been described as generic, um, so that they're, in, for example, that they're suitable for application across many system types, even if the underlying system dynamics are poorly understood. And this has made them extremely attractive for application to large complex systems, such as ocean systems, where we often have limited understanding of the mechanisms underlying ecological responses to external perturbations. And I think this uh, figure from Mooters et al. nicely illustrates this phenomenon. Here, the top left figure represents an ecosystem variable that has high resilience and is far from a transition or tipping point. And the right figure represents that variable when its resilience has declined and it's close to a transition. And what we see in the figure on the right is that as resilience declines, the ecosystem variable, the variables show higher variability and become more correlated. This rise in variance and autocorrelation that we see as the ecosystem variable approaches the transition or this tipping point uh, serves as the early warning signals of an impending shift. Early empirical applications of generic early warning signals come from the University of Wisconsin-Madison where Steve Carpenter and colleagues detected early warning signals such as rising variants uh, prior to ecological uh, uh, transitions and whole ecosystem shifts in lake ecosystems. Uh, Steve Carpenter's work in other studies and model systems and other closed systems generated a lot of excitement about the possible use of early warning signals as a tool for resource managers, which resulted in several subsequent papers that tested the utility of these indicators. Around that time, um, Mike Litzow and I had started, around the time that Mike and I had started our work, the utility of these indicators had only recently been assessed for large marine ecosystems. And the results of the studies focused on marine ecosystems, um, the results of those studies had produced mixed results. Some had found um, early warning signals to fail completely in real systems. Others found some mix of success and failures. And others presented evidence of a rise in variance or autocorrelation prior to um, a known ecosystem shift. Given these mixed results, Mike and I became interested in understanding what distinguishes successful and unsuccessful applications of early warning signals in real systems. And so to address this question, we reviewed the state of early warning signal re research. We conducted a meta-analysis of published studies, and we did a, a comparative analysis of eight Northeast Pacific Ocean time series. So for a meta-analysis, meta we uh, searched the Web of Science database and references cited within literature to identify examples of empirical early warning signal studies published um, between 2006 and 2015. And we only included non-laboratory examples that presented a quantitative test of early warning signal predictions. And so we avoided any um, qualitative tests. And um, then we categorized the systems in these examples as either non-linear or linear, and categorized the systems as either supporting or not supporting the early warning signal theory um, of seeing a rise in autocorrelation, variance, or skewness, or other statistical signatures prior to an ecosystem shift. And finally, we compared the proportion of positive and negative results between study systems that had nonlinear or linear dynamics. So now I'm going to show you some outcomes of the meta-analysis. This figure here shows uh, published papers classified by year and study type. At least 94 early warning signal studies were published in ecology and climate science uh, between 2006 and 2015, which re included review, modeling, laboratory, and field studies. And nearly a third of the papers published during those years included empirical tests of early warning signals. The next figure shows empirical studies classified by system type. In these studies, the ecosystem transitions for which the early warning signals were being tested included trophic cascades, desert, desertification, and shifts in species abundance, community composition, and climate patterns. And the empirical examples came primarily from marine and freshwater ecology and climate studies. And this third figure shows the results of a quantitative 
um, early warning signal tests compared between two study compared between study systems with linear dynamics or with nonlinear dynamics, where the blue shows the positive early warning signal test and yellow shows the negative test. So we um, uh, pulled together uh, early warning signal tests from 25 study systems reported in 19 studies. Uh, nonlinear non dynamics were de demonstrated in only six of the 25 systems, and these systems produ produced eight positive early warning signal tests and no negative tests whereas 19 study systems demonstrated linear dynamics, and these systems produce a much more mixed set of, of results, 15 positive uh, tests and 14 negative tests. And these results are pretty much in line with the early warning signal theory. For example, while tipping points can occur in multiple forms, the theoretical support for early warning signals is stronger in situations where there's evidence of hysteresis and generally weaker for linear or threshold responses. In order to further test for differences in the success of early warning signals applied to nonlinear versus linear systems and to provide an example of possible approaches for dealing with this distinction using real data sets, we conducted a comparative analysis of eight Northeast Pacific time series. This analysis used four time series from Alaska ecosystems and four time series from the Northern California current system. Data from Alaska included measures of community composition or distribution from trawl surveys in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, and time series of mean length for juvenile Pacific cod and juvenile um, walleye pollock from the Bering Sea. And data from the California current um, included population abundance time series for three copepods, including Acarcia longerimus, Pseudocalinus mimis, and Paracalinus parvus, and, a, and, a, and coho salmon as well, coho salmon population abundance. And the eight time series are um, all known to respond to climate variability on monthly, annual, or decadal time scales. So our approach for the comparative analysis was to use model selection to determine if biological responses to climate drivers were linear, nonlinear, or linear um, with hysteresis. And then we use statistical tests, um, essentially a linear model to test for the rise in early warning signals in the ecosystem variables prior to shifts in their mean values or during periods of a persistent perturbation um, in the system. So in the next few slides, I'll show you some results from this analysis. And here I'm gonna start with Pavlov Bay in the Gulf of Alaska, where we tested for a rise in spatial variance leading up to a change in community composition. And the selection of the early warning signals just had to do with how the, the different variables were measured or calculated. So the figure on the left shows a time series of sea surface temperature in blue and predator-prey ratios in green. This time series um, shows that the, there's a shift from a prey-rich state to a predator-rich state with an increase in sea surface temperature around the time that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation shifted from a cold to a warm phase in, in, late, in the late 1970s. And the figure on the right indicates that there is hysteresis or state dependence in the relationship between sea surface temperature and community composition. Or in other words, there, the relationship between sea surface temperature and these predator-prey ratios differed between warm and cold states in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. And given this evidence of hysteresis, we expected there to be a rise in an early warning signal leading up to the well-documented shift in this predator-prey ratio, and our statistical test supported this expectation. In the Northern California current, we were also interested in testing for a rise in early warning sig signals prior to changes in the mean value of ecosystem variables. In the figures on the left, I'm showing time series of the population abundance for copepod species, Acarcia longerimus. There we go, Acarcia longerimus in green, and coho salmon, sorry, coho salmon down here on the, on the bottom left. And what we found in this time series, as shown by these red lines, is that the mean values of the abundance of both uh, coho salmon and acarcia uh, shifted with changes in the Pacific decadal oscillation, essentially exhibiting some warm and cold states. And this sensitivity of copepods and salmon to the PDO was well documented. And these uh, shifts that we show here in these red lines were um, quantified using a breakpoint analysis. However, unlike our previous example, we found that the relationship between the PDO and the population of, of copepod species and coho salmon were, were, um, were linear, as we can see in these two figures here. There's really no um, distinction in the relationships between the warm and cold, cold phases of the PDO. And also, as expected, we did not detect a rise in the early warning signals prior to any of the shifts in the population abundances 
indicated by the red lines and the figures on the left. And this was also true for the two other copepod species that we tested as well, but I'm not going to show here. And the last two examples I'll show come from the Eastern Bering Sea, where we tested whether a persistent climate perturbation was accompanied by a rise, a rising early warning signal in ecosystem variables. And the, the idea here is that a persistent shift in a driver can carry an ecosystem variable between two different states. So the top left shows the time series of demersal fish community distribution in green and bottom temperature in blue. And the bottom left shows mean length of juvenile Wally Pollock in green and the bottom temperature in blue. And what we see in the top left figure is a northward shift in a community um, distribution during a warming period from early 80s up until about 2003. Um, and then the, 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 the shifts continued uh, to be a northerly distribution during a subsequent cooling of, of the, the Gulf of Alaska and a strong cold, anom sorry, the Bering Sea and a strong cold, anom cold anomaly. During the cold anomaly, the community failed to move southward at the rate that would have been predicted by the observed uh, distribution um, temperature relationships during the warming period. And this might be explained by uh, the figure here on the right, because um, we found that there was evidence of hysteresis in the relationship between bottom temperature and community distribution. We also detected a rise in early warning signal during the persistent perturbation of the cold anomaly. And this could be, could be a result of declining resilience in the warm community state. And so uh, during the shift to a cold anomaly and the persistent uh, anomaly, there, there could have been a slowing down in the response of the community distribution to this perturbation. And this uh, could, would then have resulted in what we detected as a rise in uh, autocorrelation and variance. We then wanted to test whether we observed a similar behavior in walleye pollock mean length and also Pacific cod mean length. However, the relationship between bottom temperature and juvenile um, walleye pollock here shown on the right, um, the figure was, uh, the relationship was uh, nonlinear uh, without evidence of hysteresis, and we did not detect a rise in early warning signals um, during the cold anomaly. Neither did we find early uh, warning signals associated with um, Pacific cod mean length. So to sum up what we learned from this study, um, our meta-analysis and comparative analysis of early warning signal tests demonstrate that nonlinearity and system dynamics are more likely to support the successful application of early warning signals. Early warning signals, as I mentioned, have been described as generic, which makes them attractive for applications in coastal and open ocean systems where the mechanisms underlying ecological responses to environmental per perturbations are often unknown. However, theoretical support for early warning signals is largely generated from nonlinear models, and therefore we should not expect successful applications of early warning signals um, in ecosystem variables that do not demonstrate nonlinear dynamics. And therefore, testing for nonlinear dynamics or signs of hysteresis um, is a key step for improving field studies of early warning signals. I also want to mention, though, that even if early warning signal, uh, these metrics such as uh, rising variants, do not reliably predict impending ecosystem shifts, they still may be useful for tracking ecosystem status. Okay, so the remainder of my talk, I'm going to present some work in which my colleagues and I have been developing a state index of um, community level changes. And given our previous findings on generic early warning signals and the challenges of predicting ecosystem shifts in general, we sought to develop an index that could provide the earliest detection, earliest detection of an ecosystem shift once it happens. And for this, for this work, we were largely motivated by the marine heat wave that occurred in the Northeast Pacific Ocean between 2014 and 2016. As many of you know, the Northeast Pacific Ocean experienced the largest marine heat wave ever on record, uh, termed the warm blob at that time. Anomalously warm sea surface temperatures were observed from Alaska to California. And during the marine heat wave, scientists documented many biological responses to the warm ocean temperatures, such as species range extensions and invasions, record low abundances of some fishes, seabird die-offs, and crab and clam fishery closures due to high demog acid levels resulting from harmful algal blooms. And there's also some speculation about whether the heat wave could cause a large scale change or regime shift in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. Multiple studies have been done since the marine heat wave to evaluate uh, the response of specific trophic levels or taxa to the warm temperatures. However, our understanding of the community level impacts of the heat wave um, have been limited. 
And so my colleagues and I were really interested in developing a state index of community level changes to evaluate the broader ecosystem response to the heat wave. And so our approach for developing a state index was to evaluate changes in mean community state as measured with ordination of time series using a Bayesian version of dynamic factor analysis. Dynamic factor analysis is a dimension reduction tool similar to uh, principal component analysis for those who are listening that might be familiar with PCAs, but it was developed specifically for time series data. And we decided to use dynamic factor analysis because we have a lot of time series that can be very noisy. And we wanted to determine whether we could identify latent trends or hidden trends that could be useful as indices. These hidden trends are information shared by a set of response variables that cannot be explained by measured explanatory variables. And the idea here is that large changes in uh, trend values indicate large changes in the underlying community of those shared trends. And so we could use these trends to document the range of variability in community responses to external perturbations to distinguish normal variability from changes signaling a major shift. Now, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty detail on uh, Bayesian DFAs and the method that we were using, as that could be a completely different presentation, and I'm not um, maybe the best person to give that presentation. But I did just want to provide some uh, information for those who might be interested in this method. So with the Bayesian DFA, it can handle missing values in time series, which can be quite common um, in real empirical data sets. Um, there's uncertainty around the trends are given by a range of values on the posterior probability distribution or the credible intervals. And posterior, there's also posterior density, density distributions on the loadings. And the loadings are, are essentially what link the time series uh, to the uh, shared trends. Following Sean Anderson's 2017 Black Swan paper, we can also model uh, process variability as drawn from a T distribution, which allows for detection of abrupt interannual shifts or extreme, sh extreme events in, the, in those shared trends. And um, further, we can identify whether there are different states or regimes in the estimated uh, shared ecosystem trends. And also, I just wanted to mention that the, the Bayesian DFA was um, developed as an R package on GitHub, and this work was led by Eric Ward and Sean Anderson. And if anyone's sort of interested in learning more about it, I'd be happy to share some information and could also put you in touch with, with Eric and Sean as well. So I'd like to show a few applications of this method within the context of understanding community level responses to the marine heat wave. We applied our analysis to four ecosystems in the Northeast Pacific, including the Eastern Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, and the Northern and Southern parts of the California Current. And the time series used in our analysis had to meet a few criteria. For example, they had to have a short, uh, a short lag in response. So the biological variables had to um, respond to the climate perturbations in less than a year. The time series had to be at least 15 years in length, but the longer it was, the better. Uh, the biological samples had to be sampled at least annually, and the samples uh, must have um, must be a pretty short uh, processing time for the samples, um, because if we're trying to uh, quickly detect changes in um, the ecosystem uh, dynamics, we need to uh, have quick uh, processing times of the of the the um, samples so we can get the data quickly. So our approach was then to apply models with one, two, or three trends to the climate and biology data sets separately, and then identify the best model and number of shared trends based on model selection, and then apply a regime, a regime model with one, two, or three regimes to these trends, and again, identify the best model and the number of regimes based on model selection. And this allowed us to evaluate the ev evidence for regime shifts and shared ecosystem trends uh, since the marine heat wave in 2014, 2016. I'm going to show our results for two of the Northeast Pacific ecosystems. I'll start with the Southern California Current, and then I'll show results for the Gulf of Alaska. The climate time series uh, used in the Southern California Current analysis included temperature, upwelling, isothermal layer depth, stratification, sea surface height, and nitrate flux. All the climate data came from the University of California Santa Cruz's ROMS model as a courtesy of, 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 courtesy of Mike, Mike Jaycox. The 38 biological time series included measures of ichthyoplankton abundance from the Cal Coffee surveys, sea lion pup growth rates, um, and uh, seabird, sorry, sea lion um, pup growth rates and counts, seabird reproductive success, and the abundance of juvenile rockfish and groundfish 
um, and other uh, prey species from the Southwest Fishery Science Center's Rockfish Recruitment and Ecosystem Assessment Survey. So now I can uh, show you some of the results of the Southern California Current analysis. Uh, this, uh, this, figure, this uh, slide here is showing results for the, the climate time series. What we find is that the single uh, trend model was the best model to, uh, that fit the climate time series. And the trend is here shown on the right. I chose the median values of the shared trend with the 95% confidence intervals. And that black line essentially shows where the trend value is zero. And the loadings of the individual time series are on the left. Uh, the loadings link the time series with the shared trend. And the way to interpret the, the loadings is that those uh, time series that are loading positively, so for example, those here, are essentially following the trend that we see on the right, where those that are loading negatively, so these here, are doing the opposite of this trend. So if you flip this trend upside down, that's pretty much what uh, the, the, those time series that are negative loading those time series that are loading negatively um, are showing through in their trends. So I know it's, it might be a little hard to see some of these, uh, the text of the time series, so I'm just gonna walk through this a little bit. But what we see is that uh, upwelling and nitrate flux in the central and southern California current are loading positively on the, uh, the trend here. So and what we, that means is that we see strong upwelling and high nutrient flux at peaks in these trend values and weak up upwelling and low nutrient flux at the valleys in these trend values. And if we look at the sort of the time part of the time series where the marine heat wave occurred, we see that weak upwelling and no, low nutrient flux um, occurred during the marine heat wave. And this has been um, well documented already. Um, so in terms of the negative loadings that included stratification, sea surface uh, temperature, and sea surface height in both the central and southern uh, California systems. Um, so uh, again, these, these, uh, these uh, time series are loading negatively, which means that these variables are doing the opposite of what this trend on the right is showing. So these variables are higher and stronger at the val valleys and lower and weaker at the peaks in the, in the trend values. And what this, uh, what this, um, this time series and the, the loadings are indicating is that uh, there's an overall cooling trend between 1980 and 2010, and then there's warmer and stratified waters during, oops, during this marine heat wave. And again, all of this um, has been um, already documented, which is great because it, it indicates that our uh, method is actually capturing these uh, dynamics in the climate system um, pretty well. One of the take home points of this figure on the right is that the climate state during the marine heat wave as determined through our analysis, um, is, in within, is within range of the normal variability compared with the earlier times, early time periods. So we're not seeing uh, markedly um, elevated or, or low uh, values in the climate states um, um, during this marine heat wave. Now, the, this slide here is showing the results for the biology time series. Um, again, a single uh, trend model was the best uh, model to fit these biological time series. And again, I know it's hard to see what these species are, but since we're really more interested in the community level dynamics, um, I'm not gonna focus too much on what the individual species are doing. But what we can see from the loadings um, um, straight away is that there is a co pretty good coherence among the different taxa and species in terms of their variability uh, within the Southern California current over this time period um, and this trends uh, shown here on the right. Um, so what we're seeing is that the, the trend values are bouncing up and down uh, quite a bit over the 1980s. Um, and then around the marine heat wave, we're seeing a, an increase in these trend values, pretty, pretty high uh, um, trend values around the time of the marine heat wave in 2014 and 2016. And so all these species, sorry, all these species on the right that are loading positively, which um, are, include um, ichthyoplankton, some juvenile groundfish and rockfish, prey species, uh, seabird reproductive success, uh, these are all doing pretty well um, um, during this marine heat wave. On the other hand, sea lion pup weight and sea lion pup growth in Pacific sardine um, are, have decreased, or are, we have observed sort of a decrease in their trends uh, during this marine heat wave, um, which captures what we know about what, what we know about that pretty well. Um, so again, a good take, good take home point from here is that in terms of the biology of the Southern California current, we do see these markedly um, elevated uh, trend values uh, during the heat wave in comparison to the, to the previous observations um, in Southern California current.
Now here are the results from um, the regime um, model that we apply to the climate and biology trends. And so the figure on the left here is showing the mean probability, showing the median probability of climate trends being in a particular state. And we found that a two trend um, state or regime model uh, fits the climate trend best. And the way that, to interpret this is that um, when the probability here is low, the climate trend is in, let's say, state A, but then as the probability changes to, to one, the climate trend shifts to state B. And so throughout the, the, the time um, uh, frame here from 1980 to, to 2018, we see that the um, climate trend is basically sort of jumping back and forth uh, between these, uh, between these um, two different states. And um, importantly, what we, um, we also uh, found was that we, there is no evidence of a shift to a new state in the Southern California climate following the marine heat wave. Now, in terms of the biology trend, uh, we also found that a two-state regime or um, a, a two-state model or, or two-regime model also fit the biology trend best. Um, and although there's a lot of uncertainty within these probability estimates, it, it appears that the biology trend is in one state, let's say state A, um, during this uh, cooling uh, period in the in Southern California current uh, system, and then shifts, is, shifts to a second state, state B, for example, uh, just right around the time of the marine heat wave. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty around um, this uh, uh, probability estimate, but it does indicate that there's something happening um, uh, towards the end of the time time period with the marine heat wave. Uh, but it also indicates that there's no evidence of a shift to a new uh, state uh, necessarily in the Southern California current biology following that marine heat wave. Okay, so now for the Gulf of Alaska example, we applied the same um, selection criteria uh, for the data in, in the Gulf of Alaska as we did uh, for the California current system. Uh, we used 11 climate time series in the Gulf of Alaska, which included salinity, evection, temperature, sea level pressure, and um, downwelling. And there, also, there are 48 uh, biology time series, which included uh, the abundance and phenology of phytoplankton, zooplankton, ichthyoplankton, forage fish, jellyfish, and shrimp, and commercial catches of pink salmon and coho salmon. And so I can go right into the results. Um, so here are the results for the Gulf of Alaska time series data. Again, a single trend model was the best model here. And we also, oops, and we also see by the loadings that um, um, many of the uh, climate variables were loading positively on this trend. So following what we're seeing, following the same trend that we're seeing here, whereas uh, salinity was um, one of the only uh, climate uh, time series to load negatively on this trend. And again, with, the, with what uh, our model is capturing, what we already know pretty well about the Gulf of Alaska. So we see, oops. so we know between 1960 and 19, late 1970s, uh, the uh, Gulf of Alaska was in a cooling or a, a cool phase. And around the late 1970s, there's a shift to a PDO to a warm phase. So the generally uh, warming period between 1970 up until the mid 2000s, which then we shift down to a little bit of a cold anomaly until the marine heat wave um, in around 2014. And one thing to take note here uh, during this marine heat wave um, is that the trend values are, are markedly elevated during this time and that uh, the median values, these trend values uh, were beyond the range of, of previous obser observations in the Gulf of Alaska. In terms of the biology uh, time series, we see that there's a strong coherence um, in the biology again, um, um, in terms of their variability across this time series. Uh, there's a single trend model uh, was the best fit model. And here uh, we're just showing the, the biology time series for mean trophic levels, um, given because the mean trophic levels had a, um, in general had longer time series and the lower trophic levels. So we sort of split those into two, two uh, analyses. And so what we find, uh, which, we, which we, again, which we already know pretty well about the Gulf of Alaska, is that there was a, a large shift in the community um, uh, following the 1970s a PDO shift. So we saw after the shift, we see an increase in catches of, of different um, salmon, coho and pink salmon, uh, also um, a shift in some of the uh, um, juvenile uh, um, ground fishes as well. And we see a decrease in uh, some of the prey species, including uh, pavlov uh, shrimp and caplin. 
Um, and again, one thing to notice here is that even though we saw this, we saw this big change in the community composition um, after the after the PDO shift, uh, we don't see much of a response in the community level um, following the um, uh, following the marine heat wave. And I'm sure that there are some um, uh, large responses by individual species, but here we're, we're again we're just looking at sort of the community level. And so with all that data summarizing all that data together, we don't see a, a dramatic shift in the biology. Um, or the communities uh, following the marine heat wave or during that time of 2014 and 2016. And then here um, at the biology time series um, for the lower trophic level species, um, we see some strong coherence again in the biology. Uh, if we looked at the trend values, we see that they are, they jump around quite a bit between 1980 um, and 2019. And again, similar to the biology for the mid-trophic levels, the trend values are not markedly elevated or, or they don't seem outside of the normal range of variability um, in relation to the previous observations. And now this uh, final result slide is just showing the, the outcome of when we fit the regime models to the climate trends, the biology trends, and the plankton trends. Um, and we found that the two state or two regime models were um, best uh, for all of these trends, and that the the shifts in this between one state and another were pretty uh, well associated with um, cooling and warming conditions in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, the blue, oops, sorry, the blue line um, indicates the um, state probabilities for climate. The orange is for um, biology, and the yellow is for uh, plankton. And what we see, at least within the the climate and the biology is again this shift from one state to another around the uh, late PDO, uh, sorry, late 1970s PDO shift. And also similar to the California, Southern California current, we don't uh, see evidence as of yet of a shift to a, a new community state um, in the climate biology, um, mid trophic level biology, or lower trophic biology following the marine heat wave. So in summary, my colleagues and I, we developed a method to document uh, the range of community level variability to distinguish um, normal va variability from changes signal signaling a major shift. Uh, overall, we did see some markedly elevated values of the, in the Gulf of Alaska climate trend and Southern California uh, biology trend at the time of the marine heat wave in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. However, we did not find um, evidence, at least as of yet, of a shift to a, a new ecosystem state in the Gulf of California, sorry, the Gulf of Alaska and the Southern California current following the heat wave, um, based on um, our, our methods, at least. We have been working uh, to evaluate the relationships between biological indices and climate variables and have found some stationary and non-stationary relationships, particularly with sea surface temperature. I didn't have enough time to go into that, but I'd be happy to uh, talk with more people uh, about that if anyone is interested. And in ongoing work, uh, we are including climate variables together with biological variables in the DFA models and testing our ability to um, to develop short-term forecasts of community states uh, based on forecasts of climate variables and those variables that, particularly those variables that are showing uh, strong relationships with the biology trends. And lastly, um, we plan to uh, continue to update our time series and model output and also to add new time series as they mature, um, become longer and, and are appropriate for our analysis uh, to continue to improve the models that, that we're running. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of our uh, collaborators who have been kind enough to uh, share the data with their data with us. Uh, there's definitely a lot of data that has gone into this uh, project and so we're very appreciative with those who are out there collecting the data and processing the data and willing to, to share, um, share with us and collaborate with us on our work. I also wanted to mention if anyone is um, interested in more of the results of the, um, at, at the science of the Ocean Tipping Points project, I'd encourage you to um, take a look at the Ocean Tipping Points website. It has a, it's a great web website, website that gets lots of uh, good information on the, the science that has been done by our group and other groups as well. And there's also a link to a management portal there, um, which is aimed uh, to provide resources and guidances, guidance for those who are uh, managing 
um, marine ecosystems and, and may need to be managing for um, regime shifts or tipping points in um, marine systems. So thank you very much for listening in and I'd be happy to take any questions now or following the talk. I know I didn't go into much detail on the methods. I, my goal is to try to give more of a broader overview, um, but I'd be happy to um, talk with anyone who might be um, interested in some of the methods and, and more of the details in the work that I presented today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was wonderful. I appreciate all your efforts on, on sharing um, all the information. Um, so if folks have any questions, uh, Katie is going is prepared there to um, recite the question to Mary. If you have any, please place them into the chat box. Yep, thank you. We do have some questions um, starting off. Uh, what is the effect size of an early warning signal? Um, you need to avoid confusing a tipping point from noise. Yes, uh, I agree. I don't know exactly off the top of my head the effect size, um, but I agree it is uh, it is difficult to um, certainly detect the early warning signals. Um, and especially in, in sort of the noisy data that we have in ocean ecosystems. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure about the question about the effect size, but I'd be happy to um, try to talk more about this with whoever asked that question. <laughs> Great, okay. Next question. Do you know of anyone currently using environmental DNA as a variable to determine ecosystem shifts? I do not know. Uh, I do not know that. It's a good, great question, and I think that would be uh, pretty interesting to explore. But um, I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know anyone who's doing that already. Okay. Next question: Is there any use of this with microbial bioindicators? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember seeing that in our literature review of early warning signals. Um, I so I don't think so. Uh, but I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. But I, I I don't think so. Okay. Great. Next question. Is there any hint as to whether um ecosystem size or complexity makes it more vulnerable to tipping um well i could say through the database that carrie and uh courtney had developed the tipping points i don't think that is something that came out um through their through their study um and i you know i I would lean towards. Uh, I mean, I think we see we see tipping points in closed systems such as lakes. We see tipping points in the North Sea. We see tipping points in uh, broad ocean ecosystems. So I think it's it they're really present across a um, a diverse scale of of systems and complexity. Great. Next question. Um, your next to last slide seems to indicate the biological community. Uh, shift lagged the environment's 1970s shift by several years. Is this correct? Why do you think there was such a long response time? Um, is this in the Gulf of Alaska? Um, I'm not sure about Gulf of Alaska, but we yeah. can do that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I don't. I. I mean, I would think that with the the time series that we um the time series that we use we would see that shift uh more quickly than in a few years uh so maybe it's uh um just sort of an artifact of the method that we used um but it's something we could you know we could try to explore more and look into great uh next question would you expect to see these tipping points sooner in estuarine areas um sooner than, uh, I'm not really sure, like in terms of, maybe they could elaborate sooner than, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> Great, I'll see if they, um, okay. if they pop back in with, a, okay. with okay. more of an explanation. Uh, next question, is the full analysis available on GitHub or just the 
the Bayes DFA package? So the Bayes DFA package is available with examples, um, and that data is available for the examples. Um, and uh, you could also look at the Ward et al. paper, which is published in the, the R journal, which kind of walks through the, the package with the example. And the analysis for uh, the Gulf of Alaska, which is in review now, um, I'm sure that um, that code will be uh, made available once that paper is published. And same for the California current system. Great. Okay, uh, next question. Your metrics fo focus mainly on pelagic species as far as I could tell. Do you think your findings would be different if they included nearshore habitats or foundation species? I'm thinking about the dramatic change in the kelp forest in North California after the blob. Yes, and that's a great question, and that is something that uh, someone had mentioned to me before, um, and had offered to share some data uh, to look at. To look at that, um, it's not anything I explored um, yet, but I think it would be worth uh, getting into that also. I just haven't had a time, to ha you know, I've been more focused on the pelagic species, just uh, given some of my own background. Um, but I think it would be be good to look at that as well. Yep, a good idea. Great. Next question. How is some of this evidence in tipping points being incorporated into policy or management? Um, at this point, I, I think uh, management, uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, how to incorporate it. I know there's interest in trying to include thresholds, uh, threshold information in management. Um, um, so there's, you know, it's still, it's still being developed. Um, you know, I think the there, there's a need for leading indicators. People are interested in leading indicators, but I don't think it's, it's not incorporated yet, but I think there's a lot of interest in doing that. Okay, and kind of following along that same line, um, in your research, did you find any studies, even at a small scale, of the impact of management actions in forestalling regime, regime, regime change? Excuse yes, me. actually, if you go to the Tipping Points website, there are multiple examples where uh, and some more of those might be in uh, uh, seagrass um, beds or terrestrial systems where um, regime shift, uh, where, where, where that were, where, 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 when, sorry, when that information was included, it did help uh, management of those systems. So I would definitely encourage you to go to um, the um, dipping websites to look at some of those examples. Great. Um, and Hassan has a few comments about um, capturing the regime shift and mm -hmm. um, notes that your results don't seem to capture the 1988-1989 regime shift in Southern California. Do you have any comment on that? Um, you know, it's interesting because uh, when I first ran the analysis, I, it ended in 2016. And when I did that, I um, ended up, I think, with a two-trend model. And we did detect some of the, the shifts around that time. And I think when we looked you know, more just specifically at the Cal Coffee data, we detected um, that sort of shift in 1988-89. Uh, but when I updated the data with a few more, um, um, few more years, uh, the single-trend model came out best. And it seemed like the, uh, maybe the the blob years were sort of driving um, some of that shared shared variability among the um, the different time series. So, um, yeah, it, I am uh, interested in in why maybe that wasn't detected as well. But we did detect it uh, in the original analysis before we updated the um, before we updated our our time series. Great. That seems to be the end. Oh. No, nope. one more question. <laughs> They're writing as I speak. Uh, seagrass related. Uh, Stacy's saying that she's looking at time series of median seagrass depth ranges, and we suspect that there is a regime shift to phytoplankton production with the reduction we are seeing. Would this model be fit for quantifying a shallow benthic shifts? Uh... Uh, yes, yes, I would say so. And if you would like to get in touch with me, we can talk about it a little bit more too. I'd be happy to, to talk about that more. But yes. You know, depending on your, depending on the data itself, we'd have to talk about that a little bit first. Great. Okay. I'm going to say that is the end of our questions. Okay. Uh, great. <laughs> thank you 
so much. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Mary, so much for feeling those uh, questions and, and coming up with the answers. Thanks so much for us. There's an opportunity to follow up with Mary directly. Um, and her email address is there. So if folks have questions, please feel free to do that. Um, I just want to draw folks' attention to two upcoming um, talks, uh, webinars. One is on May 19th. It's part of our One NOAA Science Seminar Series at noon on the 19th of May, and that is the Northeast U.S. State of um, State of the Ecosystems 2020 Overview by Kimberly Basile. Um, and then on June 16th, uh, at, again, I'm giving you times Eastern, Eastern time. Sorry about that. Uh, 2, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time on the open communications for the oceans. Um, there's the presentation by Howard Townsend and Isaac Kaplan, both uh, from NOAA Fisheries. Um, virtual ecosystem scenario viewer, a new tool for visualizing marine ecosystem, ecosystem models. So those are two very relevant uh, upcoming talks, one on the 19th of May and one on the 16th of June. So I encourage folks to follow up with those. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to your team. And again, uh, thanks to the NOAA Library and Katie there. So be safe and take care. Okay, thank you.